I'm Natasha, and I'm Reed. And together we are Syllogism, a science, culture, and philosophy challenge podcast on the edge of chaos. This week's challenge was to watch Cody Simmons' documentary on Kanye West called Genius. Enjoy. Metaphorically, categorically, that you're going to speak in allegory. <laughs> That's poetry jam in here. Okay, let's talk about gay. Yo, yo, yo. No, no, no. no. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. <clears throat> oh, shit. <sighs> Oh my God. I'm going to just make a caveat at the beginning of this podcast that I am not responsible for any ridiculous accents, raps, or anything else that comes out of your mouth by your own person. You know, I'm probably going to spontaneously break out into some kind of a freestyle because I'm, I am wont to do that. So I don't think, um, I don't think Ye is as crazy as everyone says he is. I think he's always been the same person from the very beginning, from early yay, yay days. And the, what's happened to him now is a product of money because money only makes you more of who you already are. He was an artist from day one. He's, he's a genius, period. And um, they're sometimes quite esoteric, eccentric is the word I'm looking for. And that's what makes them so appealing. And that's what that drives them. They have this creative influence, this creative drive that helps them relate to the world and Kanye can only re- he's kind of autistic he can only relate to the world through his creative impulses case in point the f- one of the scenes in the first episode his cousin came out to the car and was like oh so and so wants a beat but he said it's like me going into the tv store and telling people man I watch tv the best and the guy's like you still gotta pay me <laughs> so yay was like this from the beginning talking in kind of crazy metaphors you know i don't know what the term for it would be not neologism but you know yeah yeah not exactly the neology would be the specific generation of a term to describe something whereas using metaphor is probably just poetic license okay so a couple of um, observations there was definitely some elevated sense of self that you could see even early on when his mother would give him an extraordinary amount of uh, support and praise and encouragement. No matter what he wanted to do with his life, his mother was there for him. And even if it followed a path that was divergent, she really, she didn't care what it was as long as he was happy to be himself and fulfilled uh, and maybe therefore also uh, successful. Although that may not necessarily have been any of her, con- uh, any, anything that she was concerned about. Um, But there was a point I remember, and it probably was in uh, the first section, I didn't note anything by sections, where he based, she's saying, oh, you're great. And he's like, yeah, I am. And I don't need you. Something to that effect. Clearly, the level of support that he received gave him a a kind of uh, inflated sense of self. But he also was very quick to ignore the support that he had. And he seemed to kind of oscillate between a desperate need to cling to the to the cradle of motherhood and a sense of grandiosity in which he was self-constructed. Absolutely. And I think he probably already had a sufficient level of arrogance and confidence without his mother's support. But I think Donda was quintessential in all of this. And I think everyone should have a Donda, to be honest, like that, that level of motherhood, I think is just when I saw her and the way that she was in this, the way that she was portrayed, I was like, this is what a mother is supposed to be unconditionally supportive, but he was well aware of his own narcissism. He even used that term when he was talking about the fact that he was filming himself, but to our Emersonian ideology, one must be slightly narcissistic to do anything of substance. Uh, yeah, and um, of course, there's a there's there's a kind of uh, of balance I think that needs to be struck with uh, with society at large. And I think uh, he, what, to your point about him uh, always having this little uh, granule of of narcissism, which uh, then maybe became at its height. Uh, uh, something that aspired to like godhood in the nuclear family. Clearly, there were elements of relig- religiosity. He was thankful to God. He wore uh, a, a crucifix. 
Um, you know, his mother talks about God, but then as he became uh, more self-assured, more uh, removed from, um, like, let's say, all the constraints, the kind of crucible that uh, working uh, underneath Jay-Z and so forth kind of put him through, when he rose out of that, and I, I kind of did this, it's like a crucible, then a phoenix, because, and then he leaves behind the ashes. He thinks he's better than everybody, right? But to be better than everybody, he says to himself, I am a god, god. You can see this progression from worship to a kind of almost pantheistic recognition of the self as a uh, as a type of God, a component of the Godhead, or you know, the, the in a kind of pantheistic way. So he's part of a pantheon, and then he thinks of himself as the deity. The Yay fan base is very much like a- anyone who loves Yay doesn't love Yay; they love themselves, because mm-hmm. that was his mantra from the beginning. That was his mo. He didn't talk about gangster shit. His niche was in this like self-exploration, creative expression. Like I am who I am, like extreme self-acceptance. This is what the ba- the fan base was built on. So he can't go wrong. He cannot go wrong morally with his fans as long as he stays loving himself. It seems to me that uh, the hip hop genre of music basically is this kind of uh, believe in yourself, I'm the greatest, self-aggrandizement to the exclusion of almost everything else. You'll hear people routinely return to their stories of their struggles, but then they'll also uh, talk in a kind of bravado that makes everything in the world accessible to them and everything beneath them. Uh, and it's as though there's very little uh, recognition of, let's say, something like humility. And, and I think Kanye talks a little bit about that when he talks about the idea of overconfidence uh, and how that's, ju- he thinks that's just utter bullshit. There's, n- there's no such thing. You should be absolutely confident in your abilities. And there's something brilliant and almost like self-help guru-esque, but I think this is also um, embedded in the culture of hip hop. Yes, and- Kanye is unique in his niche because most of it is about superficiality. Most of it is about this braggadocious, it's rote. He understands the formula. You have to talk about this stuff. It's about money, cars, hoes, but none of those motherfuckers had it to begin with. And Kanye recognizes that he focuses more on what's intrinsic within him that he's had all along. And he's gone through this crucible, so to speak, but I don't think his crucible ended with Jay-Z. I think that was a mini crucible to prepare him for the Kardashian crucible (laughs) Uh, because that has been, I mean, he just posted something on social media yesterday that was like, it was a piece of like visual art poetry type thing where it was like divorce feels like all these things and I'll link it here, but he is going through it. And I believe Ye will use this as fuel as he has done so many times to propel him to an even greater place. Well, possibly. If you swing into a depressive enough state, uh, it may be a long time before you come out and the darkness uh, that, that, uh, that can engulf you may become so total that it becomes uh, inescapable. If you're relying on the swing back, if there's a long enough period and it's dark enough, you might not necessarily come back. And this might be why so many people who are creatively brilliant and also seem to have a kind of relationship with this, with this kind of mania and then despair. So it's like the despair is, you know, the, the, uh, the, the cauldron of creativity and then the mania is, is, is its expression. Um, you know, as, as you're oscillating, a lot of those people don't necessarily always make it back. And there's a high level of suicidality uh, with people with similar kinds of disorders. And so um, to the degree that we might be concerned, um, at least for a little while, he may need uh, more than a little bit of extra uh, support. Mental disorders like this are inherently isolating. So when you're manic, you believe in yourself so thoroughly that there's almost no one else in the world and you're considering nothing. It's, it's raw excitation uh, for you as a being alive. And then despair is also 
I am singularly bound by horrible things and uh, assailed by demons uh, while I try to sleep. And um, so, so at what point are you in relation to others? And can you even experience support? <laughs> That's a great question. But I, I think this pantheistic quality of Ye is what is redeeming him. Like we talked about last episode, the danger, the salvation is in the danger that in this Emersonian self-reliance that he has, this extreme self-reliance, if there is a chance of him emerging from this treacherous place that he's in, it will be through his fan base because it's grown ever stronger. I think he he's only strengthened his fan base and the people who were Fairweather fans will fall off. They have fallen off, I'm sure, mm -hmm. because the Kardashians were like poison for him, I think. They were, uh, the dose was the poison with them. They were homeopathy. They mm -hmm. propelled his fashion career. If any of that stuff constituted fashion, I usually dress like that when I get out of the shower. It's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on your fashion because uh, you have your own fashion, which I respect and love. But Bullshit. <clears throat> where fashion is right now, here we go. We're going to go on a fa fashion tangent. Uh, fashion is cyclical and we're trying to emulate the old. My daughter's wearing a Fresh Prince shirt. You know, like she doesn't know Fresh Prince, but she loves the 90s aesthetic, this like euphoria 90s aesthetic. So fashion is cyclical and the cycles are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter because of consumerism. Because what we need to do is keep increasing the fast fashion outfits. Like it's not good enough to wear this. This is hot. This was hot three seconds ago. Now it's not. You can only wear this one or two times and then it's not hot. People like you and I are not part of that cycle. We have, I wear all black. Like a Hasidic Jew. <laughs> but I'm like a Hasidic Steve Jobs. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> as the fashion cycle uh, wavelength decreases, it's going to become so erratic that everyone's fashion makes sense because it's like, oh, you're not in this subculture and you're not in this microculture. You don't understand this fashion wavelength that we're on. And so mm. everyone's fashion is valid until we we're, until we turn into the tunics of, uh, in a dystopian society, right? <laughs> Which is where I already am. I'm like wearing a tunic, like, <laughs> no. Uh, it's, it's really is just internet culture that permits that. So it's always been cyclical. How many times have bell bottoms gone, gone in and out? The, the rate of cyclicality is now so compressed and the potential for individuality because of that uh, is so expanded that it's almost like you're, you could be in a kind of hyper individualistic uh, uh, fashion scene in which there is no, um, th there's no overarching directive for any length of time. So it doesn't really matter what you do. Exactly. And everything feels so meta. If you, if I step outside, my neighbors are probably going to look at me like, oh, cause I, the one thing I am not is like suburban. So anybody who has any type of fashion sense looks weird all the time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I can, I can step into a room online and find a, a virtual space and find a place where if I don't look weird, I look weird. So I can, I can meet my community communal needs in terms of fashion and my physical appearance in this digital space. But strangely enough, there is still a overarching theme of fashion and anyone who can jump on that gets the, the rewards and the, and the, the Kardashians are on that vibe. Kanye was on that vibe with them. And so his fashion, you can knock it and say all you want, but the man knows the overarching themes. He, look at the tunics, the fucking tunics. I'm telling you, it's like dystopia fashion. So he knows the themes. And that's one thing about Kanye. He is ahead of the game. He knows what's coming. And that's a perfect point for me to talk about what he used in the third episode that I thought was brilliant. Ken's watching it and he's like, I, I hate this. It's like so schizo. And I'm like, yes, it is. It is so schizo. And if you notice, it gets more schizo towards the end. The, the way it was filmed in the beginning was very docile, very like heartwarming. And then towards the end, it's like not only emulating his mental state, but it's trying to hijack schizo culture because schizo culture right now is the counter 
culture. It's the undercurrent of everything that's happening. It's, it's the opposite, the antithesis to the global monoculture. It's this Deleuzian, Baudrillardian hyper-reality that's happening, this kind of like fusion of all these 20th century, um, you know, philosophers' ideas on culture. And he tried to use it because he's not a fucking slouch. He sees trends before they happen. He understands the minds of young people are in this counterculture. Hmm. And so that's how I think he will emerge as a phoenix yet fucking again from his schizo bipolar mental health disaster is by the use of, of schizo counterculture with the youth, period, period. And that's all period. Period. Mm-hmm. Okay. Period. So. And that's all period. I, th- I think he's a middling rapper. So but that's just, that's my, my impression. I think a, let me step back away from that. I think he's a middling rapper, but he's a good musician. I think he has musicality. The rapping has gotten, has gotten better, but I don't think his rap was ever great. Um, Whose rap is great? I'm sorry. I won't let this go. Whose rap is great? Uh, Tech Nine, Twista. Um, let's okay. see. Um, <laughs> I, okay. I love, I love Hobson. Um, Twista has a cadence. His his lyrics aren't actually what's great. It's his cadence that you like. <laughs> Let's see. I think a lot of the the people that are lauded for being great were also themselves kind of uh, mediocre. So it's like, like the people. Jay-Z? Uh, well, Jay Z. Well, Jay Z is he's more attitude than anything else. I can't stand um, Jay Z. I'm sorry. And, and, so, so a lot of people think Tupac was great. I think he was okay. I don't think he was fantastic. I think he's just a, he's a cultural icon because he died young. And there's something about uh, the youth and the demise uh, that, that winds up getting lauded and then their status winds up being escalated. This is what hip hop is. That doesn't mean these people were great rappers. Oh necessarily. I have this argument all they were, the time. They were, oh, they, were, they, they were okay, but they're dead. Okay, wait, let me respond. Let me respond. (laughs) Music is all about emotionality. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how that emotion is provoked, just that it is. Now, who is provoked by it will be the how it is provoking, right? Those things go together. So if you listen to any Afrobeats, the lyrics are weird because we using the queen's English uh, or whatever the fuck. She's <laughs> just call me a queen. The yes, queen's English is what we use. And uh-huh. uh, they use uh, Afrikaans, not, not our English. So to Americans listening to the lyrics of an Afrobeat song, we were like, mm-hmm. wow, this is kind of bass. Like not mm-hmm. based, but bass. Crazy things are happening. Crazy things are happening. They use the same word repetitiously. So look at Doja Cat's woman, that song. Woman, woman, woman. Try, try, try. I try, try, I just want to turn my back. She's not saying anything except the word woman, but it's powerful mm. enough in the way that she's using it. Her body movements, her image, everything about her gives that word. It gives it all of its power. It's not the word itself. So lyrics and lyricism is very much a European thing because they're, because the Europeans got into pedantic erudite things with Shakespeare is what is my hypothesis, right? So then from that, they're expecting this complex lyricism. They're expecting deep metaphors that you have to almost search to uncover. Um, I don't agree with any of this. So... (laughs) (laughs) Now, now I am a uh, I, I am a lyrical uh, multi entendral aficionado. However, I also love things just for the way that they feel, and I listen to music from all over the world. So things that are polyrhythmic, and I listen to things with languages that I don't even understand. I don't need to understand the language because I know exactly what it feels when when someone is singing. And it can, words I don't even know can make me cry with the beauty of, and the way that they're expressed. Because, And I don't even have to know the phrase. I know the feeling. There's a band uh, that I've been listening to for quite a long time uh, called uh, Dead Can Dance. Um, and the woman who sings in this, this group, her name is Lisa Girard, but she's using her voice as an instrument she's she's fabricating a language to blend in with uh with the music itself there is no actual definition to any of the utterances 
I can resonate with something if it feels right. I fully understand that. And there are things that I can enjoy that are very simplistic and repetitive or even so obscure that I wouldn't even begin to know what the meaning is. But, but there's still lots of mediocre rappers. This is high <laughs> culture. What you're talking about is high culture versus like low culture. You know, like the low culture version, version of what you're talking about is like Nickelback, right? Like, <laughs> oh my, oh, oh my God. I, I have a whole thing when it, when it comes to music with the 90s. The 90s is actually the signal of, of emasculation of, of music. There's not a single man making music since the 90s. That whole transition from rock and glam and all kinds of interesting oh, creativity, men trying to emote the screamo or the emo kind of thing, um, where where everybody is so overly emotional and everything is so androgynous that now men are, are not even men. Um, but hip hop is the opposite of that. Hip hop has oh, clearly is. defined gender roles so much yes. that female artists in hip hop are almost still not really allowed in the game unless you're talking about sex. Well, yes, they play into the uh, the hyper masculine hyper masculinization. Yes, that's all they're doing. They're, I don't even know if that's necessarily who they really are, or if they're no. just. Well, in part, because anytime you play a role, you're into it, right? And and they they don't just play the role in music; they play it in real life. They there is a role that they that they are supposed to play. In, in these relationships, but that is becoming more and more confused and more blurred with the androgyny that's happening. Everybody right. can have the, the, the black culture that accepts NBs and then the black culture that doesn't. These, that's the whole concept of multiculturalism. It's factionalizing cultures. So if we don't at least get to that point, like, I mean, you might as well just call it in. To back to the music. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you know, I think I think you reinforced the point I was trying to make about who music touches. Okay. Why do you get so mad when you reinforce my point? We're having. I'm, I'm not, well, well, that's because I did. Now I have to think about a counter argument. <laughs> I thought I was done with that bullshit. Now I'm going to have to defend myself again. Damn it. Okay. <laughs> well, you said a lot about the type of music that you like. And you and I are culturally coming from different places. Did your mom drive you around in a red geo prism with salt and pepper playing in the background? No. Oh God, no. Was your mom? But I listened to, but I listened to salt and pepper myself. Was yes. your mom a single mom? No, but my I, so so. Well, let me put it to you this way: my 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 parents were divorced. I wound up staying with my father rather than my mother. Okay. So there's a big difference as well. I'm coming from a matriarchal position. You're coming from a patriarchal position. And so there are places of origin that we arise from. And I think hip hop has a lot to do with your place of origin. I relate a lot to black culture, I think, because of the way that I was raised. First of all, my grandmother was from Tennessee, dirt floors, this kind of uh, impoverished setting that you see in Southern whites that is almost akin to black culture. So we use washcloths, which is something white people don't use. I understand from my understanding now, maybe you use loofahs, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to see my loofah collection? I have one for every day. I mean, my grandma, my grandma cooked Southern style food. And so, mm. you know, there are a lot of things that they did not use seasoning though. I will say that they, that was classic white no seasoning in my family. Um, but there are just ties that either tie you to hip hop in a sense or don't. And struggle is one of those things, but it's not the only way you can be tied to hip hop. There, there has to be some other elements. And I think one of those things is being raised with it. If you weren't raised with hip hop, you're probably never going to have the emotional connection to it. Yeah. And so that's, that's interesting. So I got into it, uh, on my own as a kind of way to escape what my parents were into, which was, you know, various kinds of uh, 70s. The rock Lawrence and, Welk show. Let's say, yeah, so, so, something like that. Uh, <laughs> I discovered breakdancing uh, with friends, but it was early on. Um, you know, we were listening to like Africa Bambata, um, you know, the Fat Boys, early run DMC. Early rap was, I think, 
lyrical in a more literal sense and not necessarily so much about the kinds of uh, vernacular that I almost think is akin to let's pseudo tonal language in, in that what we're doing with the way that we're rapping now, rather than going by, you know, traditional meters and, and trying to use language that was accessible to many, it's become its own kind of language in which America. it's the intonation, the inflection and the variation in the pronunciation that makes for uh, what the rhyming scheme is. And, and the attitude behind it and so forth conveys things that are more akin to what you would see in a tonal language where it's the same word, but it's inflected differently. And now all of a sudden you have an entirely different meaning to it. I, I agree. And I think there's something that needs to be mentioned about hip hop. Hip hop has always been about gatekeeping in some way, right? So hip hop was created for us, by us kind of thing in a black culture sense. And so now there's an infiltrate of white kids. Like I met the guy who did our um, opening sound. I met uh-huh. him at a Ty Dolla Sign con- uh, concert and just the most bizarre circumstance. I was just like kind of tripping and I'm walking around probably high as hell. And I just see this man standing there like facing the opposite direction of the crowd. And at concerts, I go off on my own. I get kind of weird um, and just like, look at what's going on. And I just kind of stopped and I like observed the situation because I think he was standing behind a sound booth. And I was Mm -hmm. like, how do you feel about this? I figured he would be ancillary in some way to to the musical group. I think it was Lil Uzi Vert that was on stage. And I said, how do you feel about this? Like all these damn white kids coming in here kind of, I don't want to say appropriate. I don't even know if I said that, but this was what I was trying to convey. How dare you? All these white kids are supporting what you guys are doing, you're all black. Everyone's black in this, in this cohort. How does it feel is what I kind of wanted to know because they had to, they ha- in order to be commercially acceptable, they have to open up the gate, but there's still this gate key- keeping that tries to happen in music. And that's through like the underground, the, the underground is where people really gatekeep. And it's not intentional. It's that we have this very unique experience. And I always consider myself un- underground. If I were to relate to musicians, it's Wu-Tang. I'm the RZA. Martin Shkreli has uh, your mixtape, by the way. <laughs> now we're getting really way off. But there's plenty of these executives who are dickheads. And so <laughs> they just picked one. And at Vertex, they had an in because Vertex did some really uh, nasty shit with the hep C stuff. And they, they just basically were like, let's crank up the volume. And they did. Mm-hmm. And they caught him and they were like, Mm-mm-mm, we need to make an example of you, but he's just one of many. Let's reel back. Let's reel back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's not screllify this motherfucker. Um, <laughs> I need to go back to, let's reel back to when yay was going through the wire. Uh, he, yeah. to me, that was the epitome of his of his yayness that was like him being him and it was born out of necessity and self-expression and you believe that if i'm that he then became something else and his bipolar disorder emerged he he was able to exhibit the requisite level of humility and drive to get himself where he needed to be while he was young when you look at some of those early videos he was he was just a kid um and you know, as a kid, uh, maybe even still looking for acceptance from parents, maybe like mom, maybe like the absent father, um, you maybe be able to find yourself um, uh, searching for acceptance and doing everything necessary to have it. But once he got through the wire and was uh, signed and accepted and uh, was receiving uh, nominations and then ultimately getting Grammys, Uh, something else happened. And I think that there's a part of this that might be coincident with what is uh, the typical age of onset of uh, bipolarity. Now, I I believe this is somewhere in the neighborhood of the age of 25. Um, It doesn't necessarily mean that you would fully manifest those symptoms at 25. But I think part of what happened was once he didn't have any more constraints on his persona, um, he was then maybe free to not only manifest the kind of narcissism that was already inside him, but then that narcissism also was coincident with the onset of the bipolarity. Yeah, I think that's when I lost Ye. uh, When the whole Taylor Swift thing happened, I was already lost with Ye because he, yeah, he was on one. Let's just say that. 
that was his full narcissism manifesting. I agree with you in this sense that he, but, but the, the only thing I don't agree with is that he was always bipolar. He was always on this cyclical up and down that I think a lot of, like you said, a lot of artists have to be, they ruminate and then they create and they ruminate and they create. But I think he's breaking that because the way I look at Ye's career was this Taylor Swift era. And then right about until Life of Pablo is when I think things started to change again. He went through this different kind of turn at Life of Pablo. And I remember feeling like, what the fuck is he doing now with all this? And I was kind of like being a hater about it. I was like, okay, this fashion, like it's kind of hot, but like also I hate it because now he's associated with the Kardashians, which is everything corporate monoculture to me, but I'm hoping he used them for what he could in this pantheistic way. And will now have an off growth from that because I think, I think yay is, is the antithesis of the Kardashians. To be honest, if you look at the way the Kardashians move through society, they're master manipulators. They are they are geniuses of media manipulation. And there's this woman on TikTok who I love. Uh, she goes by Kardashian colloquium and she's always dissecting what the Kardashians are doing. And I bet she is a thorn in their side because they like to control their media presence and they like to have their brand be this thing. So I'm sure they're also learning from her as well, listening to what she's saying and going, mm -hmm. okay, that this is how the public sees us right now. How are we going to counteract that? But, right, but right. yay is, is so much himself that he's like, man, fuck that girl. I'm sure. And that's what he's saying to Kim right now with all this stuff with the internet, like fuck what they think of you be yourself. And, and the Kardashians are like, Oh no, no, you don't understand. Our self is this plastic image. And he's like, I think having like a head explosion, but he also, like you said, is yearning for this familial thing. When Donda died, he wanted to attach to Kim and, and he saw their family and he saw the support that they have. And he wanted to be a part of that, but he don't play by the Kardashian rules. And so this is a new era for Ye because he tried to hop on that train. They kicked him off. I'm with I'm with that. So one of the things that I I, I thought of was, you know, he had a kind of uh, closeness to his mother that I think lasted for him way 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 too long. It's pretty clear in and, and you know, and I think this is probably a problem in perhaps uh, the hip hop community more generally, where uh, you see uh, lots of interesting behaviors. Uh, well, and maybe I shouldn't even you know, nix this. I'm not even going to talk about this shit. Oh, I this, like it though. This, this, could, this could be bad. I like uh, it. You're talking about single the, mothers. You're, 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 I like it. Uh huh. Your mama. My mama. <laughs> my, my, my mama and your mama was talking little shit. <laughs> I can't believe I just fucking did that. Donda herself was very aware of the need for the switch from uh, the, the maternal nurturance uh, nucleus to business. She even clearly states it somewhere uh, in the documentary. I don't think that Kanye ever really uh, escaped his need for maternal care and affection and, and support. Um, and I'm sure a lot of this happens when you have uh, you know, an absent father and you have one parent and you're holding on for dear life for something uh, that approximates security, which is why I think some of what he manifests winds up being the kind of uh, a kind of vulnerable narcissism. But I think that his mother kept him grounded. Yeah, the more, the bigger he got, the more he actually wanted his mother around. And then it seemed like she had an almost kind of um, like, like a, like an Edenic influence on him. I think of, I think of this as a kind of uh, uh, a way of protecting him from the worst evils that were, were inside himself. And then once she passed, all of the worst things uh, started to emerge uh, in, in a way that comes in part from trauma, but then also comes from the loss of the grounding that his mother gave him. He absolutely lost that when he lost her. And I couldn't agree with you more. The whole, it was very chilling and very eerie to me. I remember when she died, I didn't know shit about her or anything, but I just remember thinking like, oh my God, if there's anything I know about Kanye, I know how important his mother was to him. Yeah. And she died. 
I thought it was like through some liposuction surgery or something that she was getting liposuction. It, it occurs to me that um, a, a, an almost completely plastic person is uh, who he was married to. It's a cause. He was looking for perfection and he married like the princess of the world, right? I mean, Kim Kardashian is kind of heralded as the Marilyn Monroe of our time. She, yeah. she ultimate princess and he won her. He was searching for this queen like deity and he found her and he did not want to let her go. So I think there's a consequence of Donda of, you know, her trying to get to that point and he saw his mother as a queen. And so he wanted a queen. So Donda protected him from a lot of things. She was his, not only his guardian angel, but his mentor in a lot of ways. And do you remember when she said something like, the giant looks in the mirror and sees nothing. Yes, yes, yes. I have that, I have that written down for us to talk about. This woman. Brilliant. Yeah. This woman. And Kanye, you can see on his face, he's like, I don't know what the fuck she's talking about. He, he, <laughs> he, he clue. He, he's probably he thinking about it right now. Yeah. But what I, what I find interesting about that is when she goes on to describe what it means, she's talking about um, how you know uh, you can have your feet on the ground and still have like your head up in, in, in the clouds, and so you're this giant that encompasses both the almost like the the, the physical world, uh, but then also you can have something like uh, spirit and and uh, almost like a kind of transcendental godliness. And and so when she's saying that you need to have both of these things, and I, I've heard other people say you need both roots and wings and so forth, and this is absolutely true. Um, when he lost the roots, he had he basically I think went into a kind of uh, fr free ascent, uh, you know, almost almost like a kind of uh, Icarus. Like a, Icarus, exactly, exactly. And uh, and so he was searching in his orbit for some gravity to pull him back, and he saw that ass. <laughs> <laughs> so he he was searching for roots for grounding for for something to reel him in. And he found something very different, I think, in there. And he probably still doesn't even realize it. So even if he does realize it, uh, he was willing to accept her. I mean, he needs that family. He needs her support. And she's just like, sorry, oh, you're too <laughs> fucked up. You're a narcissist. She's like, I, I'm an empath. You're a narcissist. And I'm going to leave. It's like, I can't. But, but she's fucking Liz Taylor. She was never going to be a down ass bitch. She was never the hold them down type. She was always the climb up type. That was right. all she really wanted in life. That's her genuine desire was to be the queen of the world. And the queen of the world gives no fucks about genuine connection. Hmm. All right, Kim, hmm. as, as an Armenian, like, I feel like I have life. <laughs> well, You'll notice something very uh, interesting, uh, and that is that he basically loses Kim and then replaces her with an exact replica. This is very, very, and I know you like to, to shit on Freud and his embers, but this is this has Freudian ass embers all over it. Um, <laughs> Which, by the way, would melt a, would melt a Kardashian. She's she's uh, eighty five percent plastic by weight. So. Um, but anyway, she, he finds this replica. And, and, and so you can see that he's got the mother, he's finding a replacement, and now he's got it. Now he's got this replica. And in a strange way, uh, the replica not only can potentially reground him because it's almost like he's he's taking a person and replacing it with someone else, which means, by the way, that he didn't really. So you're saying that he loved her. Maybe it was a kind of obsession and not and an idealization and not necessarily love because love would make you not necessarily want to absolutely duplicate uh, what it was that you had, at least in appearance. Not only is he replacing her with someone else because it's like, hey, no, no matter what, you're replaceable and you're not that great because look, there's someone just like you right down the street. I got her. <laughs> but then he's also saying, now, whenever you look at me, you have to see me with you no matter what. In fact, you oh! moved on. But you, but but guess what? Guess what? You can never really leave. Oh. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh. Oh yeah. That's some genius level shit right there. Oh, I don't like it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm like, I'm I'm wounded by it. <laughs> uh okay. So I, I like this play we have where. I'm like so team light side of Kanye 
And I see that you, I don't want to say your team dark side of Kanye, but you are pulling on all of these things uh, that are dark within him. And, and I can't deny them, but if there's any remedy for Kanye's narcissism and bipolar uh, disorder, I think he needs support to find it. And I, I don't, these hoes ain't it. You know what I mean? They're not going to help him reground and refine himself. Like he needs to let go of that. What you just said he's doing, he's totally fucking doing. He needs to let go of that. And he needs to go for someone who is in fact grounded, who right. understands his narcissism, who will stand by him while he tries to work through it. And that's almost an impossible task. Well, yeah. And, and I would say that also it, it needs to be someone who is not themselves seeking anything. Yes. They have to be a fully uh, formed human. Yes. Where yes. are those? Where <laughs> are you? <from? laughs> well, I, rumor, rumor has it that they might have some, uh, you know, in, in Tennessee, but, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> The hill people, the hill. You no, know, Tennessee people have a look. Let me just say this: like I've noticed the other day, people who from Tennessee, I'm like, y'all kind of yeah. look the same. It's like when we went to Idaho, they were like, I was like, oh, all y'all Idahoans kind of look the same. Weirdly, I, I, I got to tell you, there is a there is a New England look, and, and and like a snooty upper middle class New England look that you you cannot escape. Um, you know where I am, where it's everybody's wearing the same clothes. They all look like they're p potentially on ready to go skiing or to, go, or to go climb a mountain. Yeah. It's Merrill's. It's, it's, uh, I, I have a, a friend who's got this. So it's, it's Patagonia. Patagonia. Uh, if you look at the, the roof of any car, every car, it's, 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 it's basically like a metaphor for being like a moose. And here's, yeah, here's a kayak, bike rack. Everywhere is a carbon copy. So it's a person, it, it, you can see the tendency to conform yes. literally everywhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back to uh, so a, a light for Kanye. Mm -hmm. Let's keep it optimistic because I think we all need Kanye. I think we all need some mysticism. We all need some inspiration, some uh, radical optimism in this world right now. So how can Kanye emerge again as yet the like next level Phoenix mm. from this disaster? I really think the only way is that he, so he needs something to ground him. He, just like we were saying a little while ago, he needs somebody who does not themselves desire the limelight at all, can support him in his artistry and, and be the rock for him. Uh, so unfortunately for him, I think he probably can't escape the need uh, for something maternal in his relationships. And so I'm sure that something winds up suffering in the uh, romantic sphere in part because of that. Uh, it's it's called I think it's the Madonna whore complex, right? So it's it's like you have a you have a a relationship where once once you've uh, managed to get to a point of being really close, the second you start maternalizing it, now all of a sudden you can't be uh, that erotic with this uh, um, effigy of your mother. So I wonder yeah. if if that might be a, a thing. So you basically need, so what you need, I don't know if I can describe. Maybe I need to- Let me try and describe. What I <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you're talking about, the, he needs a Madonna whore. <laughs> 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 uh, so he's going to have to let go of his own ego quite a bit to have what he needs. Because I can imagine if I were to design a woman for Kanye, she would have to be a woman who is- intelligent enough to understand him, patient enough to deal with his bullshit, accepting of what he's going to do to her romantically. He's going to cheat on her. He's going to have to, and she has to be cool with that and okay with it. Um, but he needs a life partner, you know, in that way. Well, and that's what it is. He basically, he basically needs going back to the idea of surrogate activities from our dear friend, Ted, he needs a surrogate mom. You know uh, who else needs that? Elon who? Musk. Ooh. Yep. I, I agree with that. That man has way too many fucking kids, way too many fucking plans. And he not, well, he was fucking with Grimes, but Grimes was never going to be it. He like had this like fairy esque idea of like having this. He probably thought she was just the hottest thing since sliced bread. So cool. But he can't have a woman with that much of an orbit of her own. He needs an attache. Yes. 
Yeah. It's just, it's just what it is. Like, I mean, people need support systems and, and not everybody can be Kanye. Like Cootie has to be Cootie. Kanye has to be Kanye and mm-hmm. people have to fall into their roles and accept what their roles are in this world. instead of always trying to be something they're not. And so, uh, Elon Musk needs to admit what he needs as well. I mean, he has access to the entire fucking world just get you someone, I guess that would probably make it even harder then. It's hard for uh, most people to begin with. Like like these people, Elon Musk and, um, and Kanye need a moon to their planet. Yes, yes. And then also with those, with those other relationships, um, um, the people attaching themselves to an Elon or a Kanye uh, are, are doing so for no reason other than uh, their own gain. I think he needs people like cootie around people who themselves are genuine who maybe they're attaching themselves a little bit because there's no way in which cootie was just documenting it out of the goodness of his heart to start with he was trying to leech on to a person who he thought would become famous he was looking for the release of this documentary for a long time so he what's wrong with that he well i'm just saying he's not innocent he is this kind of person who is looking for someone to orbit in order to raise uh in order to elevate himself. He's very soft-spoken and it's nice. That he's, I like the way he, I like the cadence of his speech and the way that he presents himself as, as humble and having this family life and so forth and going through his own evolution woven in through his relationship with Kanye. But there's no way that at least that initial uh, getting himself on to someone he saw potential in had nothing to do with his own, uh, with his own success. Not. But, but I still think that Cootie is a hell of a lot more grounded than anybody who is uh, already themselves extraordinarily famous in the public eye and is iconic uh, themselves. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic that he will do something extraordinary, but it will need to come with um, some really good relationships that keep him honest about who he is and not at war with the persona of someone else. A hundred percent. What were we talking <laughs> about doing next? I think we should do the next podcast on our world building experiment that's happening in book club, because I had the feeling I wanted to use Kanye's track, praise God in the piece of art that we're going to be submitting into the contest. Okay. Because- I just feel all the vibes with it that are um, homodeic, you know, we are gods, we need to fuel ourselves, radical optimism, that whole vibe is the train that I'm on. I am a god, and um, I want to say that uh, if I'm in a menage, you better bring me a croissant uh, (laughs) in this French-ass restaurant. (laughs) How akin to uh, Kanye will we be as uh, people imagining a, a future world? Oh, there's a lot of hubris. And it was almost what stopped me from submitting it. Like, I'm thinking, you know, I can't submit this, but I'm like, fuck it. My ideas are just as good as the next person's. Yeah. Fuck you, absolutely. Oh, Schwab. So for me, that's what we're doing. So, so Kanye built a world. We talked about Kanye's world. Now let's talk about the world we want to live in. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs>